it's great to see what a wonderful crowd. My name is Robin Kessler, and I was born in the 757 and raised here. Yes! So we're not just Bob Beach here, we're Portsmouth and we're Norfolk. We got folks from Chesapeake all around. It is great to see you. So I'm here today to tell you about a story about our family's wonky navigation through the healthcare industry in the last 10 years. My darling husband and I married 37 years, two children, never worried about health care. 2008 Great Recession hit, and in 2009, March of 2009, my husband lost his job. Two months later, I lost my job. So to give you some context, we're a family of four. My daughter had just graduated from college. My son had just finished his first year of college. So we're a family with no income and no health care. So when I talk about this wonky journey, there have been ups and downs, and this was the first dip, or as some would say, ditch of our family's history with medical care. So the good news is that there was COBRA, right, had just been extended to 18 months. So we had health care for 18 months, and after that expired, we, the Affordable Care Act was still through the process of getting worked through. So we went in the private marketplace, filled out the applications, the forms, did what we were supposed to do, and we were denied coverage. Another dip. So they said they thought I had a pre-existing condition, but I will tell you the only pre-existing condition I had was perseverance. And as my dad would say, stick to it, Yes, yes. So we worked it out, they revisited our application and we were granted health care. Yes, we could breathe a little. I will tell you it wasn't completely peace of mind, but we had some health care. And then we moved along and then what happened? The Affordable Care Act finally rolled out. Yes, yes, yes. I have to tell you, we were one of the first adopters. I could not wait to sign up for that program. And talking about peace of mind and uh, that we could breathe, I felt confident with the healthcare program that we had chosen and that it was there. So you can see there's been some ups and downs. A little bit outside of our journey, I will say that in 2018, I'm proud to be a Virginian and proud that Governor Northam was able to get Virginia involved in the Medicaid expansion program. Yes! Hundreds of thousands of Virginians got access to health care for the first time. This was a big deal. So thank you, Governor Northam. Good for Virginia for participating in the Medicaid expansion program. So back to our wonky ride. It's, you know, you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? You have ACA now. Well, the problem was in the last 13 years, Republicans have continued to nip at the Affordable Care Act. Right, Dr. Allen? Yes. They tried through legislation, through the courts, to disband it. And if you think this, the um, 2017 was an easy year for folks on, on um, the Affordable Care Act, you're wrong. It was a time of uncertainty. So there was more of this. And I'll tell you, uncertainty is not good for our country. So with that being said, you're wondering, OK, why am I here? Well, I'm here to tell you that we need to remain vigilant. We can't rest on our laurels. We can't let them take us backwards. We need to move forward. And the good news is we have a president who cares about health care, who's passionate about health care, who's been an advocate for health care. And he will move us forward. He wants to see access to more expanded, to more Americans, so they too can have a peace of mind. And so with that being said, it is my privilege and the greatest honor of my life to introduce the leader of our great country, and it is a great country, the President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden.
I... <laughs> Robin, you know my dad. By the way, you docs are good, but if there's any angels in heaven, they're all nurses, male and female. You know why? You guys let us, you guys make us, allow us to live. Nurses make you want to live. I'm not joking. You lie there in the ICU, which I've done for a long time, and you look at those machines, and you know the line goes flat, that it's over. But you just get tired. You don't care. When I was at Walter Reed all that time, after a couple of craniotomies, I was lying there, and I had a nurse named Pearl Nelson, military. She'd come in and do things that I don't think you learn in medical school, nursing school. She'd whisper in my ear. I didn't, couldn't understand her. She'd whisper, she'd lean down. She'd actually breathe on me to make sure that I was, that there was a connection, a human connection. She even went home and brought back her pillow from her own bed because she didn't knew the one where I had, it wasn't comfortable. But I'm not joking. My son, Bo, came back from Iraq after being all that time within shouting distance of a burn pit. He had stage four glioblastoma. He went as an incredibly healthy guy. He came back, and for 18 months, he fought. And the nurses, the docs were incredible. But the nurses would say, toward the end, he'd come in to look at him and say, no, no, not, not now, doc. And the doctors knew enough to know that it wasn't the time. The nurse didn't think it was there. You're so underestimated. You really are. And in no ways to diminish doctors, but I want to tell you something. Nurses, single most underestimated profession in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And Robin talking about her journey. My dad, if you have a seat, please take it. If you don't, come on up on stage with me. You know, and Robin, thank you for the introduction. Robin, my dad used to say it a little differently. My dad used to say, everybody needs a little bit of breathing room, just a little bit of breathing room. At the end of the month, can you, in fact, pay your bills and still be certain your family's going to be okay? We lived in a uh, three, we weren't poor, we were a typical middle-class family. Four kids, we lived in a three-bedroom split-level home with a grandpa. And my headboard was up against the wall where my dad's on the other side, my dad and mom. One night, I remember my dad, you could hear how restless he was. I got up the next morning, I was in high school, my senior year. I said, what's the matter? Mom, what's the matter with dad? He said, this company just dropped health insurance. Well, you know, a lot of people face that. A lot of people worry about it right now. But he said, just a little breathing room, a little bit of certainty. Just a little bit of certainty, it matters. So, Robin, thank you for the introduction. And Mayor Bobby Dyer, the mayor came out. To, I told the mayor he was very gracious with me, even though I'm one of those Democrats. <laughs> Bobby, where are you? There you are. He came out to the airport to greet me, and I said, you know what the worst sentence in the, in the English language is? I'm at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for your graciousness, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it very much. And to all the mayors, all the mayors stand up. Come on. All the mayors stand up. <laughs> Toughest job in American politics. You know why? You all know where they live. <laughs> <laughs> no way to go to the Dunkin' Donuts or the local store without, Mr. Mayor, what about this? But anyway, thank you for what you do. I really genuinely mean it. And it's great to be back in Virginia Beach, home of so many brave women and men who served our armed forces and this, make this nation so strong. I really mean it. Well, they, although they couldn't be here today, you have two amazing senators. You know that, Tim Kaine and Mark Warner. They are true champions of this great state. And Representative Bobby Scott, a lifelong fighter for Virginia workers and families who's back in D.C. introducing what we call the PRO Act to make sure unions have an equal right to organize if they want to organize. I want to thank all the health care workers here today. You, you know, I really mean it. 
Thank you. Thank you. By the way, you care for people when they need it most. But the most important thing is, you know what you do when you help someone in, in trouble and need? You, you, you provide them the dignity they're looking for. The dignity. Just to be treated with dignity. That's what all Americans deserve. Peace of mind that comes from knowing that an illness, if it strikes or an accident occurs, you can get quality medical care and recover and heal. But we all know that too many folks don't have that peace of mind. Too many folks lie in bed at night, staring at the ceiling, wondering what will happen if their spouse gets cancer, or their child gets sick, or something happens to them. Well, they have to well, they have the money to pay the medical bills. They'll have to sell the house. I get it. That's why, since I was sworn in as president two years ago, my administration has focused intensely on getting more people affordable health care and bringing down medical costs so you have a little bit of breathing room again. Woo! Just breathing room. And that's exactly what happens when we protect and strengthen programs like Medicare and Medicaid, which millions of Americans rely on, and millions. And it's been my focus, and I believe we've made significant progress. Now we need to finish the job. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little, a little bit about today. My plan that's uh, in stark contrast to not, by the way, there's an awful lot of really good Republicans, but the MAGA Republicans are a different breed of cat. No, I, they're not bad or good. They're just very, they're very different. There's kind of like, in my view, sort of two Republican parties. And I've served a long time. Some of my closest, as a joke goes, but not a joke, my closest friends in government have been my Republican colleagues in the Senate. And folks in Congress, they want to eliminate a lot of health care coverage, those mega Republicans, increase costs for millions of Americans, and make deep cuts in programs that families and seniors depend on. And that's what's at stake now. Two years ago, when I was sworn in, the economy was reeling and the pandemic was raging. We lost over a million people. Hard to believe, but over a million people. And our health care system was at the breaking point. And all, all the healthcare workers here remember, better than anyone, those dark, dark months as the number of COVID deaths kept rising, hospitals had to have, have patients in hallways, literally setting up tents in their parking lots in a situation where, every, because everything was full, every bed was full. That's what we we're up against when I took office. We immediately got to work. We turned it around. I signed into law the landmark American Rescue Plan, which provided the resources to get COVID-19 under control, our economy back on its track. And many of you worked around the clock to get people vaccinated against COVID-19. We went from 3.5 million people vaccinated when I took office to 230 million fully vaccinated today. We made vaccinations available to all Americans with a plan based on equality. Many of you went into communities that have been ignored in the past. We went into public housing areas. You went to places where they didn't usually go to make sure that everyone, everyone had equal access to this life-saving shots. And it worked. We came through, but with a terrible cost, as I said, over a million people died from the virus. In addition, we expanded health insurance for millions under the Affordable Care Act by making it easier to sign up and by making it cheaper to get better health care and affordable care, saving families $800 a year. Where I come from, $800 matters. The result is more than 3 million people have newly signed up to the Affordable Health Care Act. And today, more Americans have health insurance under the Affordable Health Care Act than ever before. And folks, it didn't stop there. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than any nation on Earth. Let me say that again. The United States of America, we pay more for prescription drugs than any, any nation on Earth. And I've been fighting for years as a senator and as a vice president to get Medicare to be able to negotiate lower drug prices for these companies. Guess what? The only outfit they couldn't negotiate with, you know, but that's how the VA works, and it should work. They negotiate, so we're only going to pay X amount of dollars for that particular treatment. And if you wanted any, any help on, for, for the VA system, you pay that, you charge that, or no more. Well, finally, we got it done. I signed the Historic Inflation Reduction Act. We took on powerful interest. 
bring down health care costs so you can sleep better at night. And it's, it's, it's had profound impact. For example, one in 10 Americans, one in 10 Americans has diabetes. Every day, millions need insulin to control their diabetes and to stay alive. Insulin has been around for 100 years. The cost to make that drug and package it is make it $10 and package it 13. But you've been paying three, four, five hundred dollars a month for that. But big farmers has been unfairly charging you that much. Record profits. Not anymore. <laughs> we capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors on Medicare. When I introduced it, it was for all Americans. We got over 200,000 kids with type 2 diabetes. They're not covered. But guess what? Type 1 diabetes. It saves their lives. But here's the deal. My, some of my friends cut out everything but the Medicare piece. But guess what? We've got it covered for everybody. We've got to finish the job. Yeah. And by the way, look at the profit margins of these companies. They're hundreds of billions of dollars. It's not, it's not like they're getting hurt. Come on. Let's cap the cost of insulin to $35 a month for every single American who needs it. We're the only country doesn't do that. This law also caps out-of-pocket drug costs for seniors on Medicare at a maximum of $2,000 a year, no matter what drug you have to take, total. And a lot of you know we're making real progress in my cancer initiatives. Cancer drugs, though, can cost up to ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 a year. But you're never going to have to pay next year more than $2,000 a year for all the drugs you can sell. Plus, if drug companies raise prices faster than inflation rises, they'll have to pay Medicare back the difference. And guess what? It's not only fair, it reduces the deficit when you do that. Folks, we're really giving Medicare the power to negotiate lower drug prices, just like the VA has done for years for veterans. Bringing down prescription drug costs doesn't just save money for seniors in Medicare. It's going to have a significant effect on the federal deficit. It's going to lower the debt by $159 billion. And you say, well, how can that be, Joe? Well, right now, the government, our tax dollars, pay out through Medicare the help for the prescription drugs. If they have to pay out $159,000 billion lead, <laughs> less for prescription drugs, then it reduces the deficit. So, folks, it's a win-win. It saves taxpayers' money, it makes Medicare stronger, and it reduces government spending overall. For years, we've been trying to make that happen, Democrats and Republicans. For years, Big Pharma has been able to block it. But at long last, we got it done. This is historic progress. And I wish I could say my friends on the other side, all of my friends on the other side, are there to protect and defend and build on it like I am. <clears throat> Again, sadly, the mega Republicans the Congress, those in Congress who threaten to undo the gains, they want to do away with that Affordable Care Act. Some threaten to default on the national debt unless I accept certain economic plans. Now, let me explain the national debt you all know. We think we all know it. It's the accumulated debt over 200 years. Every year it's accumulated over 200 years. The federal government has never, ever once reneged on that debt. We've never questioned our credit. And guess what? Let's remember, the last administration increased the federal debt by 25 percent. The 200-year debt, in four years, they increased it by 25 percent. 200 years. And folks, how did Congress respond? Well, quite frankly, they did the only responsible thing. They paid the debt. They voted three times to keep paying America's bills, to pay the debt without preconditions, without a crisis. If they paid the American debt then, why in God's name are they threatening not to pay it now? So, folks, it's not all the other team. I'm not saying everybody on the other team says that. But it's just politics. And they've got no business playing politics with the lives of the American people and our nation's economy. Folks, and by the way, 
You know, you hear ads of the big spending Joe Biden. In two years, I reduced the debt $1.7 billion. $1.7 billion. The largest deficit reduction in American history. And I met with the new House Speaker, but not a bad guy, about how we should proceed to settle our differences without jeopardizing the full faith and credit of the United States of America, which would be a disaster in terms of our economy. Here's what he said, what I said to him, actually. Instead of making threats about default, which could be catastrophic, even if it doesn't happen, because the, the markets around the world began to hedge against it and it affects the economies, let's take that off the table. And let's, let's have a conversation about how we're going to grow the economy, lower the cost, and reduce deficit, each of us. I said, let's lay out our respective budgets. On March the 9th, I'm going to lay down in detail every single thing, every tax that's out there that I'm proposing, and no one over 400, making less than $400,000 is going to pay a penny more than taxes. But lay it out by March 9th, everything, and what we're, what we're going to cut, what we're going to spend, what we're going to do. Just lay it on the table. And I've invited them to Republicans. They should do the same thing, lay their proposal on the table. And we can sit down and we can agree, disagree. We can fight it out. When I introduce my budget, you'll see that's going to invest in America, lower health costs and protect and strengthen Social Security, Medicare, while cutting the deficit more than two trillion dollars over the next 10 years. But by the way, I want to make it clear. I'm going to raise some taxes. If any of you are billionaires out there, you're going to stop paying at 3 percent. <laughs> Not a joke. The idea that a billionaire, we used to have 600 or so in the United States of America, now there's 1,000. The idea that they pay at a rate that is lower than the rate of a police officer, a school teacher, a nurse, is bizarre. You're going to see the people making less than $400,000 a year, as I said from the very beginning, will not pay an additional single penny in any tax. <laughs> if I can hold a second, one of the reasons I was able to keep the debt down this time around, they're the Fortune 500 companies. They're good companies. I, by the way, I come from the corporate capital of the world, <laughs> Delaware. <laughs> More corporations are incorporated in the state of Delaware than every other state in America combined. I got elected 36 years worth of that. So I'm not anti-corporation, but I think everybody should pay or take a fair shot, pay a fair share. Now, look, here's the deal. Reason why I was able to lower the deficit and still expand programs like health care was there were 55 corporations in 2020 when I came to office who made $40 billion and didn't pay a single penny in tax, not one penny. Well, guess what? I did a terrible thing. I got passed overwhelmingly with just my team's vote. I got passed a 15% tax. My God, 15%. Raise your hand if you'd accept a 15% tax. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Well, I raised enough money to allow me to do the things I've been able to do. 15% minimum tax. Like I said, 40 billion in profit. That's just 55 corporations. We're paying zero. As for my, 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 my mega Republican friends, they say they want to reduce the deficit. We did the math. Based on what we know so far, they could change their minds. Their plans would explode the deficit, increasing it more than $3 trillion over the next 10 years. Because they want, to, they want to cut taxes for the very wealthy, again. They want to cut taxes for large corporations. They want to take back the power we just gave Medicare and Medicaid to negotiate, which would raise prices. And they would have a huge giveaway to big pharma and cost taxpayers billions of dollars. And if they say they want to cut the deficit, but their plans actually would explode the deficit, how are they going to make the numbers add up? What are they going to cut? That's the big question. For millions of Americans, health care hangs in the balance. Will they continue to fight to cut the Affordable Care Act and make health insurance more expensive for millions of Americans? <clears throat> Republicans have been trying to undo the Affordable Care Act 
since it passed 13 years ago. They voted to change or repeal the act, it's a fact, on the record, more than 50 times in four years that it existed. 50 times. And they made repealing it part of a virtually every Republican budget since the law was passed, from the Trump administration budgets to congressional budgets to their budget plans for just this past year. So let's be clear about the consequences. If you get rid of the Affordable Care Act, it would mean that more than 100 million Americans with pre-existing conditions would lose the critical protections they have now. The only reason people with pre-existing conditions or on a private insurance are able to pay is because they have the Affordable Care Act. But by the way, <laughs> you cut the Affordable Care Act, millions could lose free preventive care like cancer screenings. Millions could lose basic services like maternity care, which insurers would no longer have to cover. Up to 3 million young adults will lose access to their parents' health insurance, which they're on right now if the Affordable Care Act goes. They're the facts. Not making any of you. As they used to say, it's even it's no longer relevant. But Google it, you know, you'll see. <laughs> and nearly 40 million Americans would be in danger of losing health coverage completely. That includes millions of low-income Americans who currently get their health insurance through Medicaid, which the Affordable Care Act expanded in 39 states. And it includes millions of middle-class and working-class families who currently are covered by the ACA marketplace. Even if they did manage to keep their health insurance, it would cost them thousands of dollars more per year than it does now. That's just a glimpse of the damage of repealing the Affordable Care Act would do. You know, the MAGA Republicans in Congress are, uh, want, do they still want to cut Medicaid? Well, the former Trump budget director, who's now advising them, that is, Republicans in the House, on their fiscal strategy, has a plan to slash over $2 trillion from Medicaid. And so, well, whether it gets passed, that's, that's the plan, okay? He wants to end Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, and then additional deep cuts that could lead to nearly 70 million people losing critical services. Most of them are seniors, people with disabilities, and children. Some could lose their health insurance altogether. Millions of seniors and people with disabilities who depend on Medicaid to help pay for their home care, including home health aids, could lose their ability to remain in their homes. And by the way, it saves the government money if they're home and not in a nursing home. And those long waiting lists for home care, which has gone down under the last two years, last five years, 20 percent would likely rise again, and states with no waiting lists would likely have them again. Medicaid also pays for nursing home care for about two-thirds of all Americans who live in nursing homes. Cut Medicaid, and the quality of care in nursing homes goes down because the help goes down, the salaries go down, access goes down. Rural hospitals across the country that depend on Medicare to cover uncompensated care could close their doors. Already, more than 500 rural hospitals across the country are in risk of closing. You know what the statistics show? If, in fact, you have a serious accident and you're in a rural community, you have a four times greater chance of dying than if you had the same exact accident in a, in a, in a community that is more populated, because you can't get to the hospital. You can't get many places throughout the Midwest. You have to drive 30, 40 miles to get to a hospital. By that time, you're dead. Not a joke. It's not hyperbole. It's a fact. And so, folks, look. In fact, two, from 2010 to 2021, over 130 hospital, hospitals did close. Entire communities depend on these hospitals. Getting Medicaid would shut many of them, not getting Medicaid would shut many of them down. Studies show further that the more, the more likely you are to pass or have serious injury, the further you are from access to a hospital. The time when so many of our kids are dealing with painful mental health challenges, millions could lose access to mental health care as well. At a time when so many of our loved ones and neighbors are struggling with opioid and epidemic in the millions, 
could lose access to drug treatment facilities. It would be devastating. What about Social Security and Medicare? Well, are they safe? During the State of the Union, as some of you may have seen, I was... I, I, I've been around for a lot of State of the Unions. I never saw one where the President got to negotiate in the open with everybody. I was pleased to see so many Republicans stand up. Remember when Marjorie Taylor Greene was yelling, liar, liar, Biden's a liar. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. They don't want to cut anything. I, so I, when I asked, I said, OK, you don't want to cut anything. Everybody who says we're not going to cut Medicare or Social Security, when I asked them to join us and reject the cuts in Medicare, wasn't it something? They all stood up. They all stood up. And they're all on camera. <laughs> Got all their pictures. Like I said, I believe in conversion. Maybe they found, as my grandfather's, maybe they found religion on Social Security and Medicare. I sure hope so, all kidding aside. But I'll believe it when I see it. For example, Senator Rick Scott of Florida, the guy has been saying for a year, for a long time, that he wants to sunset Social Security and Medicare every five years. What that means is every five years it comes up, if you don't vote for it back in existence again, with the same, exactly like it was, it goes away. Or you can reduce it. You can do whatever you want. But every five years, it has to be voted on. Now he says, never mind, don't need to do that. <laughs> Although I noticed he didn't say, never mind about Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act. They're still in the chopping block, even in Senator Scott's plan. Look, make no mistake, if mega, if mega Republicans try to take away people's health care by gutting Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, I will stop them. <laughs> Folks, here's the bottom line. The work that we've done to get more people affordable health care and bring down the cost is going to reduce the deficit significantly. It's making a real difference in people's lives means more security, more dignity for millions of families. We've got more work to do, but we've made a lot of progress. I was in the northern part of your state about a year ago doing a town meeting, and a woman stood up and started to talk about the cost of insulin. She said, I have two kids, and she went on. She was very articulate, and she got a very emotional. She said, what do I do? I don't, can't afford the insurance. Well, how do I look at my child and say, I can't help? I can't help. I'd like you all put yourself in that position. Your child has type 2 diabetes. So we share the insulin. What do you do? Imagine being in that circumstance. There's no means by which you could do it. We've changed it now. We've changed it in terms of, but we haven't changed it permanently in terms of making the same requirements for the elder, for all people as they do for the elderly in Medicare. Folks, families across the country are starting to breathe this a little easier. We've just got to keep it going. I've long said it's never been a good bet to bet against the American people. And I can honestly say, as I stand here today, I've never been more optimistic about America's future. We just have to remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there's nothing, nothing, nothing beyond our capacity. When we work together, we can do anything. So God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you.